Bullet to Veteran Podcast. Thank you for your service. All right, everybody, welcome back to Bulletproof Veteran Podcast. We have on this week, Phil Myers. Now, if you're like me and you follow him on Instagram, you know he's always a very positive force. Uh, You know, he's talking about ice baths and yoga and all this great stuff. And I've been wanting to sit down and talk with him for a little while now because I think he's got a great message on mental health, um, looking at yourself and really improving yourself, especially as you transition out of the military. He has an amazing story. The stuff that this guy has done, you're going to love listening to him. So again, just super excited to have Phil on the show. Phil, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Hey, thank you very much for having me on. Ah, great, uh, man. Um, please, as we usually start off on the show, I always like to hear a little bit about you know, where you came from, how you got to where you are now. So please tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Uh, I just want to hit on uh, something you just said first. Uh, as far as like, I uh, got a lot going on. I think it's been one of the hardest things, especially like on social media and Instagram, trying to figure everything out because, you know, a lot of my friends are, hey, to be successful, you need to niche down. You need to niche down and you're too much of a jack of all trades. And I was like, oh, okay, I keep trying, but it keeps like, you know, almost like it's just rebounding back and I just keep having the same problem. So I kind of just said, hey, I'm going to post a little bit about everything and see what, what happens, what, what gets the most traction. When I realize is I'm getting traction from all of it. I have people that are my, uh, I have my friends that are like, hey, dude, my, my nervous system is fried. And I, between your posts and a couple other people's posts, like I'm starting to kind of figure out science, understand what's going on. And I'm getting a little bit from you, a little bit from them. I've got other friends, you know, that are hopping on like, hey, what's up with the hike? I'm talking about sobriety. Um, I do some handstand stuff every now and then, and all ties into like me and like my transition and in the past couple of years, of my life and going through some, uh, some rough times, but it's giving me this platform that I'm not really that, that niche down. Um, like I said, I had trouble every time uh, I try, right. uh, but it allows me to have this kind of just like Jack of all trades widespread. I had a friend call me the other night, like, Hey, I put the pieces together of everything that you maybe you've been through and you know, uh, I won't get into his personal details, but uh, from the soft community and same stuff. And uh, I, I like it. I like being out there a little bit, uh, but a little bit of myself. So yeah. I was in the military, uh, Navy brat, uh, and I went in uh, the college at Appalachian State and I hopped right into the military. I was a CB for a couple of years. Good made the jump CBs. on over. Yes, I was. Uh, I did that for a few years, did two deployments with them. And then I hopped on over and I made the transition to uh, Navy EOD, which okay, I did wow. uh, one. Yeah. And then I did one tour with them. Uh, originally, I had planned on coming in and doing a full 20. I was like, man, this is what I want to do. It's what I saw, you know, my dad and a lot of my family members do, you know, have successful 30 year careers. And I was just like, uh, the benefits are amazing. And, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, the paycheck. And fortunately, you know, we can talk about that maybe a little bit. That's what keeps people in that want to get out. Um, and eventually I had a lot of fun. If you have any specific questions, please ask. But yeah. I mean, I had a wild ride for nine years. The training had to be crazy for EOD. I mean, that's not, yeah. I think what Navy EOD training, actually all the branches really trained out in Florida, correct? Uh, so if you're Air Force, Army or Navy, you, you go down to, uh, to Florida to train for EOD, don't you? Yes. So it is a joint school. Yep. Um, the branches, some of them have a little bit of a prep program before. I know the Air Force has a prep program, which I do believe is down there at Eglin. Yep. Just getting people ready for the range. Uh, the Navy, are, our pipeline is a little bit longer. And that doesn't mean it's, it's better or anything. It just means it's longer or more specialized. You look at Navy EOD, it's a, a jack of all trade who is specialized in all of those individual trades. It's a lot. So we, go, we have prep, kind of a, a little more physical. That's up at Great Lakes. Uh, the ones of us that make it through there, uh, we will then head down to Panama City mm-hmm. uh, for a little over two months. We'll go through Navy dive school down there, and then we transition over to the range. So some people, you know, especially depending on maybe injuries or just academics, like you could be your months and months over half a year for sure, like into this process before we even hit what's called the range. And that's where you were talking about, like down there at Eglin, all the services. Uh, we all go to the joint school together and mm-hmm. spend about seven months at the range. And then everyone graduates except for Navy. So then we have an additional three-month follow-on 
uh, it's called underwater phase. You know, it's where we started to get into the bread and butter of, you know, Navy EOD. Uh, for the past, you know, since 9-11, we've definitely integrated in strongly in the desert with soft. And we, we still do that. And that's one of the reasons why we're so, we spend all this extra time specializing. So we can, we can integrate in with them. But as far as the diving part, we have an initial three months. You know, we hop in, uh, we go back through scuba. We go back through our, um, our rebreather rig if you would, uh, which allows us, you know, capabilities of diving pretty deep, uh, also diving on uh, influence ordnance. You know, we're talking everything that we just learned to do above ground, we're going to now do in the dark, on, okay. you know, in, in, the, in the water. It's a lot of fun, very physical, uh, very academic demanding as well uh, for another three months. And then we get to graduate. So okay. by the time we graduate that, you know, some of, some of the people we went to the range with, have already been to their units. Uh, I had a couple of people that were actually uh, army that uh, they were on their first deployment. Wow. Before I even, yeah, they hopped in their unit and they went on the first deployment and they're down range and we're just graduating. And then we have an additional, uh, we have additional three months after that. You know, we, we go through a uh, jump school, we go back through a uh, uh, tax school and we have a, a combat expedition a combat school as well. So we're still like six months before we even touch our first unit, uh, you know, check in and everyone else has already graduated and working. And then you wonder why you like to be a little bit of a jack of all <laughs> trades. Yeah, I mean, you just, you couldn't get away from it. <laughs> just, it's awesome. I, I love it. It's a little bit of everything. You know, one day we could be diving in the, actually in the same day, we could jump in the morning, you know, and, uh, and do a water jump in the morning. This is something we actually retrain as far as our, uh, one of our final exercises, the final week, you know, we could jump in the morning, we would uh, dismount and uh, hike into a village. You know, if you would, that's been set up for us with drills. We could run drills there. Uh, we could be diving that night, you know, we have to have with that, you have to have everything prepped. So not only are you doing, you doing mission sets and drills, if you would, the day before, you're also prepping on that gear for the rest for tomorrow. It's extremely diverse and uh, it definitely keeps you engaged. So for, uh, for listeners that maybe don't know or are non-military, what exactly is EOD? So it's explosive ordnance disposal, yes. but, but what is that? <laughs> If you look at uh, e EOD, exactly. Like, so it's explosive ordnance disposable. Uh, a lot of people think about it as uh, the best way I've been able to describe it to my friends and family is uh, special, the Navy Special Operations uh, Bomb Squad, if you would. Okay. And that usually, because a lot of people do not understand what it is and they ask a lot of questions, they get us confused and they just assume we're other communities. And then you have to kind of like dissect and, uh, dis you know, we, what do you want to say? I try to backtrack and explain to him what it is. And you end up going down this rabbit hole. You're like, hey, uh, I dive, I jump, I shoot. You know, we, we do chem, we do bio, we do conventional like IEDs. You know, we, we help out, you know, here and there. And you, you have this huge rabbit hole and you lose people. But at its core, uh, we, we go in front of other units, if you would, and we integrate with soft units to make sure they stay safe uh, to explosive um, uh, threats. Okay. All right. Yeah. I just don't want to leave anybody behind when we start talking. You know, we throw out acronyms, especially for Yes, non yes. No, thank you. Yeah, I'm, no, because my- I'm trying, to, I'm trying to catch myself. It's just I've been so immersed in your EOD. Yeah. EOD, but but then again, again, I realize I go to events and functions and people are like, hey, oh, what's that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things that, and, and whenever I talk to non-military people, and when we start throwing out acronyms and stuff like that, you lose people so easily because- not everybody knows what the hell you're talking about, you know? Um, so it's, it's a kind of a skill to describe what each, you know, career yes. field does and all the different things that you could, that you could possibly do. Um, but that's awesome. I mean, it's, it's definitely a testament to yourself that you completed that school. I know for a fact that that EOD school is not easy. Um, I have friends who have been through it uh, from the air force side. Uh, it is grueling uh, to say the least, because I think it relies so heavily on the academic side um, where some other career fields where they might be more physical, say, which is possible, but the EOD side, you have to have the memorization and the academic side is uh, a, a constant beating on you. It's, it's constantly, uh, you know, on your back kind of, as you're also taking care of all this other physical stuff that you have to do. Exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a extreme mix of academic and physical abilities. And sometimes, sometimes you're going to be doing both at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the, this memorization, this creative thinking and this problem solving, and that's one of the biggest things, you know, we're, 
we're problem solvers. Hey, there's a problem. Okay. How do we, how do we execute and keep other people safe while keeping us safe, but doing this effectively and timely as well. Yeah. And the, the physical, you know, the exercises, if you would, if, if you want to call it, call it that, you know, while we're being asked academic questions, um, it kind of just uh, definitely cements that academic knowledge, which you need. And uh, it's interesting. They say that EOD school kind of shows that you're able to be an EOD tech. When you show up to your first command, that's when you start learning how to be a lot of those principles you learn through school. Right. Definitely will apply and are great uh, uh, fundamentals to know. But when you, you hit, you hit there, you're, 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 you're a brand new, new guy and you have a lot to learn now. Now you get to learn how to be an EOD tech, you know, at the unit level. Yeah. So you had this idea that you were going to stay in for 20 years. Yes. Now you're EOD. What happened? I started, so I grew up in the soft community. Mm-hmm. Um, I was surrounded, uh, Navy, uh, special operations, if you will, you know, divers, EOD, uh, Navy SEALs. Uh, it's just, uh, the community that I grew up in as a kid. And then I was like, that's what I always want to do is my dream. I got my dream job and I started seeing a pattern, you know, a lot of things, uh, with mental health, a lot of guys struggling. And then my eyes were just open. You know, I started, I had, I had my own struggles and then I started to realize that I wasn't alone. And then I started to realize that a lot of people are struggling and they're just not talking about it. Okay. And then I saw that we have a very small community of what I do. And as I started talking a little bit and getting help, I noticed that guys would catch me. Uh, this is, definitely do uh some of it due to stigma some people are very like worried about losing their job losing their clearance that uh, guys would catch me in the parking lot or in the stairway on a one-on-one and hey uh, they started to ask these questions i mean i was almost this go-to um guy like hey um i heard you went over to mental health and had an appointment or hey i heard you like you know i did this or that or you know and i understand that meant then people were talking about me either you know good or bad and but what it was, it didn't really matter to me. I was like, okay, hey, people are talking. It's all I need, right? Right. And I realized that I started, I had a phone call from a couple of friends. They're like, hey, like, she's leaving me. And I was like, all right, um, whatever you want to tell me, man. I'll, I'll share what I'm willing to if you share, like, you share what you're willing to. This is learning for me as well. And I had a couple of those phone calls or a couple of people that just called me and said, hey, like, I'm not good. I don't know what to do. I'm not okay. And my response was, I started realizing is this, I kind of started waking up to some of the problems that are going on in the military. I had other friends reach out and uh, definitely social media has been a great platform, but I kind of saw that there is, I've always wanted to help. You know, that's the thing with EOD. Like we, we protect people, you know, we, we, we help other people, you know, that are, they're in danger, if you would, and we keep them out of that danger. And so that's always been my calling. And I realized there was like a higher calling. I said, Hey, you know, um, I got to work on a, with many different groups, especially from going from, so when I was, a, I'll backtrack a little bit. When I was a CB, uh, mm-hmm. I definitely always looked up. You know, I spent uh, five, six, six months in the desert with the Army and Navy EOD and, and Rangers. Uh, we had a couple other uh, groups that were there as well uh, that I, I supported. And I always looked up to those guys. I was like, man, these guys are titans. They're awesome. Like, that's what I want to do. And then I got there. And then I saw that the same units that supported us saw us in a similar light. And I was like, well, this, this is a platform. I was like, you know, that people listen. And mm-hmm. if I've noticed a, a lot of soft guys, you know, you've got, uh, you've got guys that are leaving the military from every walk of life in the soft community uh, to pursue like mental health or whether to be in a yoga instructor, start a yoga company to or start speaking out like, Hey, I have a drinking problem. And people are like, you know, it's a huge in the military. People are like, they'll make fun of you for taking anti-anxiety medicine or they'll have a problem with that they don't have a problem with how much you drink at the bar. Right. You know, long, it, it, so I was just like, it's almost a badge of honor drinking. Yeah, so you know, it, it okay. always has been. It's okay to get blackout, you know, if you would, mm-hmm. sorry, I mean, say like that it's, at the bar and we get you home safely and do that every single weekend. But for guys that use the word mental health and anxiety and depression, like is, is like, is like taboo and voodoo. Cause that you can, you can drink as long as, you know, nobody says anything, but then you can't get help for the other stuff. Cause everyone's worried about losing their jobs. Right. But to wrap all this, like what I'm trying to say is that I started to see a pattern in a bigger problem. And I had a couple of opportunities. I was coming up on my contract and I said, you know, where can I make, where can I help? Uh, where can I do the most help? And I saw what yoga and uh, meditation 
I did for me. So I went and got, you know, my 200 hour certification. I'm now a yoga teacher pursuing further advanced uh, meditation and yoga, which we can talk about a little bit. Yeah. And then even when, once I took this step, that was huge. It opened my eyes because guys were like, wait, you're, you're doing better. Like they saw it. I didn't have to tell people. They just saw me better. And I was, I was acting better, you know, um, feeling better, uh, responding. I was talking again to people, you know, I was interacting and they're like, what's going on? I'm like, Hey, I'm going to yoga, man. And uh, a lot of the guys made fun of that. So I was just like, cool, whatever. But say if a dozen guys dog me for it, then I had that one guy that would stop me and be like, hey, tell me a little bit about this. And I got them going and they were better. Right. So if I could just help just one person, I was like, hey, like, this is a good path. Like, I've got a lot of traction. It's also helping me out, um, helping them out. This is what I want to do. Awesome. So I decided to not reenlist which is still, uh, I still struggle with it. You know, it hit me a couple of weeks ago. I, I woke up and I said, what did I do? I said, I, I, I loved what I did. I waited my whole life for that job. But then I get a phone call from another friend saying, Hey man, I'm not, I'm not good. What should I do? I said, Hey, like I'm not a therapist. I was like, I have, but this is, this is my story. And this is what I can recommend. Definitely getting one. I was like, however, like this is the path that I, I gave as much advice and help as I could to that person. And it helped them. Not only help them, it helped their relationship, help their marriage stay together, you know, and see things in a different light. So I was like, okay, this is this is the way forward. Uh, I decided to get out, start applying to grad school uh, to go back and become a psychologist and work with these communities, do research. Because I, I started looking at the numbers and it, I was amazed that less than 1% serves on active duty. Yes. We got what, as of like the last census, we had like 330, 331, some million people million. in this country. Yep. And only a million of those are, you know, we've got roughly 15 million veterans um, ish, depending on which, which exact survey you look at. And we've got a million on active duty. I was like, man, okay, there's this huge gap. And I speak both languages. I want, or I want to be able to speak both worlds. You know, I can speak. Uh, mental health civilian. I can also speak, you know, military. I can speak military from, you know, the special operations side. I can speak it from, you know, the the, the support side, you know, all in my, my experiences and also mixed with my struggles. I was like, I can make a difference. So that's when I decided to finally, you know, it was hard. It, it took me a long time. I still, I still struggle with it a little bit, but I said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm at the end of my contract. I, I, I've served this honorably and it's, it's time trying to do something, you know, bigger than myself. They can they actually, they'll, they'll help the people that I was working with. So when you, when you got out, so this transition, see, this is what I yes. always find so um, interesting, especially from the special operations community. Um, but it's the military as a whole, because I went through it and I wasn't special operations. Yeah. I, I was a mechanic. Um, I actually spent some time with the CBs. We train, we have a, a, a school out in Port Wanimi. Um, so yes. the Air Force I was stationed goes, out there for a couple of years. Yeah. So we, that's where our school is. So, you know, okay. again, support side, but all my friends who transitioned out of the military, whether they're special operations or a mechanic who was next to me working on a K loader on a flight line or something all kind of remember this time of just not knowing what the hell was going on. This exactly. ultra shock, whether they did five years, four years, six years, 20 years, 30 years, this ultra shock when you first get out and from the soft guys, there's this high speed. You are just, you know, the best of the best for the military. And then all of a sudden you're out and you're just another person. And that has to be really yeah. scary. I, I, I'm okay with using the words, uh, being scary and scary. Yeah. Like there have been scary times. So I've been out it's three, three months of the day. So this is actually kind of cool. So I am 90 days out. Wow. I, um, and I, I feel that whether you are special operations support, um, after duty reservists, like it, it, we all have, very it's 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 a difficult challenge very and challenges are and you are they keep popping up that I, I didn't expect you know different thoughts in my head and i'll dive into one of the big examples where like it actually like woke me up and said wow this is happening but yes uh, i know we spoke a little bit last week and f for myself personally i was uh, i was on secret service detail la last year supporting yes. different mi different missions uh the entire campaign both parties uh, all different type of uh, everything from dignitaries to uh, you know VIPs that were under the protection detail, the secret service, 
And that was, that was wild all the way from New Hampshire to the very last night, you know, uh, before ele- election night, like it was a, on top of, you know, uh, sorry, that's something that EOD does across all branches. You yeah. know, we, we support them to help out with different hazards, which are very unique to, you know, what, what we do because their job is protection at the end of the day. And we, we get to help out with a little bit more, uh, re- like job relatable, you know, technical expertise in the field. We help advise them is the best way to explain that. Uh-huh. And I was gone. I was gone, 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 gone. I was on one plane after another, you know, I hit, I got lost in time zones. Like I called my parents. They're like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, Hey man, it's one o'clock here. Where are you? And I was like, I forgot, you know, that was, uh, that was very interesting. It's, it's very high drive. Even you don't expect it. You always think about like, Hey, what, what's it going to be like when I walk out of this compound and like, I'm not wearing the uniform anymore. And but you kind of get towards the end, you start to have these thoughts. You don't really know what it's like yet. And even if I was in, in a training cycle or helping guys train out, because obviously we, we wouldn't be on an active team, right? As we're getting ready to come out mm-hmm. uh, and transition, we have that time. Uh, you're still busy, busy, busy. And if you want to just focus, uh, you, know, you had a couple of questions on the special operations world, you know, it's, it is, it is very high drive. Like I said, you know, I mentioned like we're j- jumping shooting, diving, you know, we're, we're running EOD drills, you know, we're training our team, we're training other teams, you know, it, it's a lot of stuff. And then trying to go from, you know, like a hundred miles an hour to, I don't want to say zero, but to 10. Yeah. Uh, at first you're just like, you get this freedom. You're just like, Hey, I'm, I'm free. And then it starts to set in, you know, you get the sense of loss. And it's one of the things that uh, I was like, Hey, what's going on here? And I realized that, part of the, uh, the suicide problem we have is well not part of it it is like the first like 12 months like it's uh, it's when we're, we're most get, most at risk if you would you know peaking you still there yep yep i got you all right all right sorry about that that's, that's all right so so you we start peaking around six months you know for the for the services the navy for some reason we peak our suicide numbers in the first year the highest around three months and not, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to read more on, on that exactly. But the, the numbers are the numbers. I started realizing that, man, transitioning is rough. Even if you have a plan, because even if I were to hop from one job straight to another, say if I would have gone right into a, a, another, you know, federal job or yeah. civilian job, like I still have loss, you know, it's kind of like, uh, my friend described it best as like a breakup or divorce. And if you don't just, if you don't hop in, that's the best way I know how to describe it. And unfortunately it's relatable to a lot of people. Uh, And imagine going from like one relationship to to another relationship and never dealing with the good and the bad from the previous one, you know, Mm -hmm. you just get distracted for a while. It's going to hit you eventually. But if you take time, you know, right now, like I'm, I've taken this time I saved up and, you know, clear my, clear as much debt as possible. And I was like, Hey, I'm going to go back to school. It's my plan. But even with that plan, like, Man, I, I kind of miss it. Yeah. You know, I know I did, but, uh, you start to, what's it called? Like when you get, if you want to consider it like relating to like a breakup, you start to like, uh, look at all the glamorize it. That's it. You start to like, yes. Hey, what were the, what were all the good parts? And then you start missing all the good parts and you got to sit there for a second and said, wait a minute, hold on. There were fun times and not so fun times. You got to balance it back out in your head and just stay the course. But it's, I'll tell you, I woke up two weeks ago, like I said, and I was just like, what did I do? Yeah. Like I had my dream job and I'm like, no, this is, I stay the course, uh, go the way I, got, you know, one foot in front of the other, you know, we'll talk about the hike in a little bit, literally one foot in the other, mm-hmm. but it's been, it's been very difficult. And I say the most, it's, um, uh, the biggest thing that hit me that I wasn't really expecting was the identity, the loss of almost identity. And when I had to go back into that emergency surgery, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I called the ER. I was like, all right, I'm not going to wait for them. I'm gonna go ahead and call them. Let them know what's going on. So, Hey, this is, Hey, how's it going? Uh, you know, I got patched over to the lieutenant. Finally, I kind of told the nurse what's going on. Patched over to the lieutenant. And he's like, "Hey, who is this?" I said, "Hey, this is," e-. and the E almost came like so. My designator in the military was EOD one, which meant I'm EOD and I'm a first class petty officer, so I'm an E six. And so those four combination, uh, those, those four digits, if you would, kind of said a lot about an individual, you know. And it started like I was what I was used to, and I was like, "Hey, this is." this is Phil. And like, I would like that, just like that. I was just Phil. And it's it hit weird. me. I was like, I was like, I was like, wow, this, this is, 
this is weird. I'm not a EOD one Phil or EOD one Myers anymore. I'm just right now. I'm just Phil on the way to, to the, to the emergency room, you know? And then I was like, Oh, how do I, and it started hitting me. I was like, if I didn't have my mom here right now, obviously somebody able to call the front gate and got me in, but I was like, how would I have gotten in, you know, say if I just showed up, you know, imagine the back and forth. I don't just have this magic card anymore that lets me in, right. you know, and they, they, they weighed me through. So it was just, it started like snowball one hit after another. And I was just like, lost a lot of stuff. Yeah. But, but with that and the flip side, you know, I could, I could sit there and just then uh, let that get me down. I've been like, Hey, who, who am I going to be? Who do I want to be? And the, the, the good part is, uh, or the hard part for a lot of people is focusing on that. Like, you get to be whatever you want. Like I'm 32 years old and I, I can, I can do whatever. I can start whatever profession I want. I just have to start over, which is fine yep. and, and drive through it. Uh, but yeah, there, there's been a, a lot of, a lot of loss routine. Um, getting out with doing the surgery was probably uh, as far as losing my routine routine was uh, probably not the best, the best thing in the world because mm-hmm. uh, got a very strict routine that, that helps me stay on track. I lost that, you know, with the recovery of the surgery and everything kind of started to spiral. Yeah. I, I'll be honest for me when I got out and now I've been out for, for quite some time. I've been, uh, I got out in 05. Um, okay. So, but I still can tell you, I can remember how I felt when I got out. And if I'm completely honest with myself, the hardest part for me was not having the people around me. It was a, like I felt very alone when I got out. I came back to Long Island, New York. Most of my friends that were around before I joined the military were gone. Um, Most of my other friends were still in the military. Most of my friends either stayed in for long periods of time or actually went 20 or 30 years. Um, And now I was trying to get a job and I was working and I was going to school but I was all by myself and I, I hadn't been by myself in years. I mean, years, yeah. the entire time I was in the military, I could always just turn around and there was one of my buddies right next to me um, for whatever reason, doing the same stupid shit I was doing or telling me to stop doing the stupid shit I was doing. Yeah. Um, but I always had somebody right there. So I, that was really hard for me. And I would imagine that that's got to be tough when you're in the, the team atmosphere of special operations when you are so, so used to that team and always having that guy's back that's right next to you and, and knowing they have your back. Now, all of a sudden you're out. And like you said, if it wasn't for your mom taking you to the gate, what would you have done? Yeah. Like, I, had, that's crazy. I, had call, call, I had to call a couple of neighbors around me, which are from the, the respective communities that I, I work with. You know, uh-huh. I could have called them at two 30 in the morning. and been like, Hey man, can you give me a ride to the hospital? They, they would have definitely have done of it. Course. Um, and that's, that's an interesting thing. Like, uh, Virginia, uh, is so saturated with military. Yeah. And even though we're from small communities, we, we kind of group together in the same areas, if you would. Mm-hmm. So, uh, won't name any names, but like, I've got guys from, you know, the different soft communities that live like right around me. That's good. And the, the thing is like, we don't exactly work together. We don't do the exact same thing, but we, we kind of do, if you would, you know, like mm-hmm. as far as like where our minds are, you know, the sacrifices we make, you know, uh, as far as like for the job, uh, the family, like we, we can relate on that. Like uh, some of the, a lot of the training we do is similar. The way we speak is similar and, and the way we think uh, definitely is very similar. So I have like, the sense of community, but what happens once I go back to Raleigh or when I'm, you know, when, what happens, you know, when I, if I say I moved to New York and I, I go to school up there, like I'm now, I'm leaving my bubble of people yep. that I can walk, I can walk to someone's house and talk to them and hang out. It, that's another challenge. You know, I wasn't, excuse me. I wasn't, uh, I was not expecting, uh, you know, that that's coming. And I'm like, Oh man, Hey, that's going to happen. You know, I wasn't thinking about that. And a lot of people can get very discouraged because it seems like it almost when, once you're separating and transitioning it can be one hit after another. Yes. Yeah. And it, people it, it will be, spirals. It, it starts to s- stack. Yeah. And not, not in a good way, uh, for, for some people and, uh, help, uh, unhealthy habits start, you know, they don't, they get off a routine. Uh, it's very easy to get off of a routine when you're like, Hey, I'm out. I can do whatever I want. I don't right. have to ask permission to another, another adult to drive three hours and go see my, my family. I'm, I'm free, you know, but with that, like, because we've spent, I spent a decade 
asking permission for stuff, even as an adult, you're almost like this infant stage where you've got to like relearn things. You're going to make mistakes. Yes. But having people around me that have transitioned, especially, you know, my, uh, I have, uh, to my uncle and my father, you know, they kind of been helped me out a lot. Uh, but you know, recently people that have recently transitioned, like I've reached out and I'm like, Hey, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. They're like, Hey, all completely valid. That's where I was. It's okay. This is the path I took forward. And those people, those individuals were a guiding light for me. Some of them from the soft world, some of them from not from the soft world. Um, and that's what helped me though. I was right. like, Hey man, like, um, I've got a plan. I'm moving forward with it, but I need some help. Like this, this isn't easy. You know, how do I navigate this? How'd you navigate this? You know? Yeah. And those individuals or what's really helped me the most the past three months. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree because when I would call up one of my one of my buddies from the military got out right around the same time as me. And I got to remember, that, like I said, it's 05. So this is not FaceTime. Yeah. There's no Zoom no, calls. There's none of that crap. You pick up a phone. We really weren't even texting that much, you know, then you pick up a phone and you talk to a person. And I was able to talk to one of my buddies down in Alabama who had got out a little bit before me, but around the same time. And it, it made me feel so much better because he was saying the same crap I was. I miss this. I miss that. I miss this guy. I miss the parties or I miss, you know, uh, everybody being together, uh, you know, at the end of the day or at night or whatever, going to dinner together, talking shit after an exercise or after a deployment, whatever. Um, at, but it validated what I was kind of going through in my head. Like, okay, I'm not, I'm not crazy. This is, this is real. I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to be like this. <laughs> you know, that's so, the hard part. Like you, you just spent so, however many years in the military, not being able to like, actually we, we don't openly talk about feelings and emotions, no. you know, it's just, no. and all of a sudden you have them all, you've had them the whole time. Let's be honest. But yeah, now you course. have them. Now you're, you're losing things. And it's really easy. It's, it's kind of like, I've got, you know, some of my friends were like, Hey, it'll be all right. You'll just get over it. And I'm like, okay, this person who just made that statement, like they, they probably really struggled. Right. And now they're maybe, they're, maybe they're bitter about it and they didn't have that individual to go to, or they didn't know how to ask. That's the thing. A lot of people like uh, had a good friend. I said, uh, two nights ago, reach out. He's like, Hey, um, you know, relationship problems. And he's, uh, like I said, I don't want to get too specific in people's lives, of course. but he's like, Hey, like I didn't even know he's like, cause he said, Hey, how are you? He's in his small talk for a little bit. And finally he was like, I'm not okay. He's like, he's like, Hey, I didn't know like what to say or how to bring it up. And I was like, that's it, man. I was like, just, just text somebody and say, Hey, I'm not okay. Like you're obviously, you're putting a lot because that person may not know what to do or how to respond. That's something that I definitely want to work on helping people how to, uh, how to know and be educated on how to respond when a, a buddy or teammate, you know, but res- like says, I'm not okay. Right. It's very uncomfortable, you know? And, um, but and I said, Hey man, like I've got you, you know, he's like, I, I didn't, he's like, dude, I feel weird. He's like, I don't know. Like, he's like, I shouldn't have said anything. Starts backtracking. And I'm like, Hey, I, I've got you, you know? And just having people, the biggest thing I've realized is just having people talk about this stuff helps so much. That's why I like being a jack of all trades and talk a little bit about everything. Right. Cause for me, I didn't know kind of like this identity crisis almost. And it's like, who am I? What do I like? What do I want to do? You know? And I tried a little bit of everything. People are like, Hey, you need to focus not just on social media, but in life. They're like, Hey, you're, you're doing too much. So I've got 20 things going on. It's a little bit scattered. I understand. I, I kept it track pretty well. And I tried a little bit of everything and I saw what didn't work out. I let go. And I took that energy and I applied it towards what was left. And eventually I've got a pretty good path forward. But I mean, just that mentality alone of like, Hey man, try everything where it doesn't work out. Just, you know, use that energy towards what's left. And people, they don't think like that. They're like, I had to have a plan right now and I got to make money. And it's got to work out. And they'll get into, an, like, if you want, like I, I like using the relationship example, but hot from the military, you know, one relationship to another relationship. Right. They want that stability. They want that paycheck. You know, maybe they have a family to provide for, uh, if you would. So they, they hop into something else, which maybe is not what they want to do. And then I'm looking at it myself. Like I'm taking a lot of time off. I'll take, uh, say I get into grad school, like I'll start in August, like o- almost a year. 
wow. which is scary scary to think about because I'm I was just going to say, yeah. most people aren't okay with taking that amount of time to them to themselves. It's it's one thing to do. You could give a year to somebody yeah. else, but it's hard to give a year to yourself. That's that's very difficult to do. And I thought, like, man, I could do it. Uh, coming out of my last relationship, which which lasted almost a decade. I realized that like, Hey, like not only am I on now, when I say I'm on my own, we already talked about since the community. Right. Mm -hmm. And then like, I do have those individuals around, but there is this feeling like I'm on my own, not only like as far as professional wise, but Phil wise, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I know I just, you know, talk to myself in third person, but it's really what it is. You start having this inner dialogue with yourself. You're just like, all right, man, you have to learn a lot of stuff. And it's, uh, you know, we can transition to the trail in, in a little bit, but yeah. that, that, that's part of my transition, you know, because uh, if you look at it, like, I was like, what do I know? What is comfortable, even if it's uncomfortable? And I was like, okay, I know, uh, you know, military training, deployments. Okay, how do I, tra- how do I take what I know, what I'm comfortable with, and put it kind of like in the middle of my transition so I can have a, trans- a successful transition and have all this time off? I'm not working a part-time job, which there's no problem with doing that. Right. But that could lead into more identity crisis. Like, you know, I could be sitting there saying like, what am I doing? I just went from, you know, jumping out of airplanes and protecting, you know, presidential candidates, like to whatever job I'm doing now. And you're, even if it's, I understand the mentality, like you're going to be like, Hey, this is less. Am I less? Like, like, man, I, I went from, here to here like you know i dropped off the mountain and that's not the, the truth like you're still whoever you want to be yeah. you're just in a transit transition phase between that and uh so for me if you want to talk about the hike a little bit i would love to because i'm i'm very interested in how first of all the why and how you came up with the idea to do this um so definitely please tell us tell us a little bit about the hike Exactly. And the best way to transition and segue into the hike is talking about, you know, um, one of the reasons why I left and what I've been learning with the the military and transition Mm -hmm. is that every step that I've taken has led me to learning and my uh, learning more definitely about the community, have my eyes open about mental health and military in general and and seeing like new struggles. Like I never thought that. So I originally thought, Hey, I'm going to leave. We're going to start focusing on like the issues that my guys and uh, the guys and girls that I work with, like, focus on, I mean, you know, and then I can also use that and help out everyone else who is not in the, the special operation communities as well. I just can help everybody that's in. Okay. And then I was like, wait a minute. As I, as I transitioned out, I was like, wait, a struggle. There's a struggle in the military. There's also huge struggle with transitioning. You know, people are scared of it. And then yeah. people, um, for multiple reasons. And I keep learning more. I was like, Hey, well, there's a huge problem this first year of transition. Hey, there's a huge problem in the first six months of transition. I was like, well, that's where I am now. So how do, how do I mitigate, you know, have possibly having the same issues. And that's when I was like, Hey, I'm going to go do the hike. And the hike was something I've been thinking about for my whole life. I've actually, ne- as far as I know, I've never stepped foot officially on the Appalachian trail. Okay. And even though I grew up in, uh, grew up in North Carolina and I went to school up in the mountains, it's kind of amazing to think that. So originally it was like, Hey, I'm just going to do this as part of my adventure. You know, and that, I'm just going to do this for me. And then I started realizing, and I was like, hey, I kind of, I need this. Like people are asking questions, but for me in my transition, I need this. And I was like, okay, so what's now, man, we're going to knock on some, on wood about this because I realized I'm getting ready to say, but my initial thought was like, what could be so diff- difficult, you know? <laughs> what Two, could go wrong? I was like, wait a minute. I was like 2,200 miles. So technically 2,193 miles for this year. I was like 14 states, depending on, you know, four or five months of my life. Um, I understand some of it's going to be fun. There's going to be a lot of very uncomfortable, like um, possibly dangerous situations, you know, especially doing most of it alone. I was like, okay, so it's uncomfortable. It's not going to be the most fun in the world. Um, Some of it's just going to suck, to be honest. I'm going to be cold. I'm going to be wet. I was like, okay, all things that are familiar that I understand. I was like, but when you go through those things in life. You know, a lot of people will bail or quit. Right. And they're like, Hey, like, this is uncomfortable. This isn't what I want to do. Like, even though they had this amazing end goal, this bucket list thing that, you know, say, I think they say one in four people complete it. So out of every 4,000, I think roughly that's the number, you know, three to 4,000 a year 
about a quarter of those people finish it. Okay. That, that set out to do the entire thing. You know, some people just quit, which is, you know, for multiple reasons, they like, you know, you've seen the movie walk in the woods. They're like, Hey, I got what I need out of this. That's not really quitting. Like you've reached your personal objective of what, whatever you needed for a reset or what he was, the character was looking for. Some people get hurt, um, multiple mm-hmm. reasons, but I was like, Hey, okay, this is a challenge. This is a beautiful, amazing life altering, uh, uncomfortable, not always fun challenge. And I was like, cool. Sounds right up my alley. You know, I was like, uh, uh, as far as the technical part, you know, putting all the gear together, playing everything out stops, getting, uh, emergency GPS, have my mom and, uh, different, uh, my mom's going to be my go-to for this. Yeah. And, uh, my mom and my dad, and I was like, Hey, like, I'm That's not awesome. going to be broadcast. <laughs> yeah. Just cause for safety reasons, I'm not, she was like, she's worried about bears and wolves. I'm worried about things that walk on two legs, you know, yeah, sir. at the end of the day, like, I'm out there by myself, you know, I'll probably find a tramley tramley is your trail family, you know, yep. people that, uh, so I'm excited for that, who I meet, uh, sharing stories, but I realized like, this is a huge adventure. This isn't just like a walk in the, uh, a walk in the woods for myself, you know, no play on the, on the movie or the book, but, uh, I'm like, this is an amazing like transition. It's kind of like, uh, I was talking to my dad the other night and I was like, Hey, it's kind of a deployment if you would, you know, um, and it keeps me engaged. You know, I've got very technical with the gear, trying to go uh, pretty lightweight for, okay. you know, uh, for obvious reasons. So it, it's given me, you know, in between my schoolwork, it's given me time to look at like the technical aspects of the gear, you know, which we love gear, right? So like, I, we have so much stuff in EOD because we got to do so many different things that there's just so much stuff and so many Connex boxes full of amazing, you know, fun toys and gear and tools. So I was like, okay, so that's fun. You know, I've got my map over here that I look at every single day of the different states and different drop points, starting to plan that out. So you get the strategic part, you're playing it out. Of course. It's like I'm doing, a, if, if you would, I'm doing like a civilian adventure with my, you know, I'm, but I'm taking my training and my, my approach to it. And uh, I want to learn. So there's a lot of, just in that, there's a lot of different reasons why I want to do it. Right. But it helps keep me engaged. You know, we're talking about myself a lot, but I realized that this will help a lot of other people as well. So I'll be talking and doing open dialogue, you know, during my, however long it takes me to do it. I'm shooting for hundred days, realistically probably four months is what I'm planning for with my, you know, weather and zero day window that I'm, I'm going to bring up a couple of things, you know, I'm definitely going to be putting things up on YouTube about it and on videos and talking about it on social media, find a good balance and then see what people want to ask questions about. And we'll talk about that. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's just as simple as like, Hey, like you and I talked about, uh, I'm not trying to hop right switch subjects just yet, but we talked about sobriety. Yeah. You started having some questions and I was mm-hmm. just like, and now we're, we go from, you know, the trail to transition to sobriety to now learning about HRV, you know, which, you know, heart rate variability for your know, cardiovascular purposes. Yep. So it's just like, we were just all over the place, but all of it helped yeah. if, if you would. And, so give me like uh, a platform and other people a platform to talk about things that are going on. Right. Whatever's going on in your head. You know? Yeah. Whatever's going on in my head. And uh, that's it's very interesting. Uh, uh, when we got interrupted a little bit, you know, I had a phone call from a friend. You know, I talked to him a little bit later, but he's like, we were talking, uh, I'm approaching this more from the ment- uh, mental side. Mm-hmm. Hey, what's going on in my head? Like during this hike, not like, Oh, Hey, I'm, I'm sad today, but like, what is it like when I wake up at six o'clock in the morning after being rained on for a whole week, exhausted, tired, and I'm laying in my, you know, goose down sleeping bag, warm as can be and dry. And I know I got to get up and go back out in the rain to finish this. So it's just one step in in front of the other. And I feel is uh, people can, can watch this and they can ask questions and I want to be very interactive. Now, are people going to be able to join you along the way? I'll be putting out more messages. Uh, uh, actually, yes. So okay. I, I, I do, and I, I would like to have a couple of people, you know, spend some time in the trail with me, mm-hmm. be out in nature. It's another reason why I'm doing this. There's something that cl- like switches over. You know, I was one person when I was here in Virginia Beach, whether I was at home or at work. But when I got to the mountains, went up, back up to Boone, where you know, Appalachian State is, I was almost a completely different person. I was actually at ease relaxed. Yes. I, I could like turn, turn things off. And that's one of the reasons why I'm going to go spend so much time, uh, on, on the trail. Well, and we were talking a little bit before the interview about some of the studies that I've done in the past, uh, when I was doing my masters, um, one of the things that I studied was the, the impact of nature 
uh, for cognitive decline. And, and yes. my, my world was space. So I was thinking about space travel. And if we have to go away from Earth for long periods of time, how can we bring the positive of nature with us? And in doing that research, I read paper after paper about all these different uh, weird phenomenons that that happen when you are in nature, um, how your brain actually works, changes. It, it, yes. It's a rejuvenative um, uh, characteristic of nature. You, Absolutely. you get it back. You get back to a, a more zeroed place and you're able to de-stress and you're able to think clearer. Um, they did uh, one study that I, I specifically remember was they had people take this baseline test they took one group and they had them in a, a, a very monochrome building, industrial. Okay. They had them take this test and they do it under stress. So they, they add some stressors in there, but you have to answer these questions. They took the other uh, group and they put them in a very modern type building with landscapes through the windows and beautiful light, um, more of a daylight, okay. not the yellowing light that we have in a lot of our lights. And they compared how the two groups did and the group obviously big, you know, big surprise the group that was yes. in nature did substantially better on the on the test than the group that was in this weird you know industrial type building something out of like 1984 um so i am very interested to see how this is going to affect you as you kind of go through N kind of knowing that you're you're carrying a lot in with you mentally, physically, yes. Uh, there's a lot going to be on your shoulders as you kind of do this. But I think the benefits that you're going to get from that time in nature on your own terms is going to far outweigh any kind of the stress that you're going to go through. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited just to see the whole process kind of work its way out. Um, now, you talked about sobriety a little bit. Yes. You have been a very vocal person on your Instagram about the, yeah. the the struggles that you've had in the past and what you're doing now to kind of right the ship, say. Um, now, obviously, you're carrying that into this hike, um, but it was something that you wanted to highlight during the hike that it's okay to kind of reset yourself. It's okay to yes. kind of look at, at your own behaviors and make adjustments. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, absolutely. Um, so I, I, one of the biggest thing I struggle with, there hasn't been a lot, especially the past couple of weeks, obviously I've had surgery and recovering, mm -hmm. but I'm a little overwhelmed because here I am. I, I feel like you talk about the weight on, on my shoulders and I definitely feel it. And it's, I'm not practicing right now, especially the past couple of weeks, but I preach, Hey, just get out there and post something and just get started, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm not even trying to make everything perfect. It's just like, how do I get this message out? Uh, between hiking and transition and mental health and like, yeah, I'm stretched pretty thin. So it's like, how do I get this out and make it effective? So it will help people. And the sobriety is definitely something that, you know, we talk about mental health, anxiety, and depression, you know, and uh, other issues going on, but now you like compound it with sobriety. And this is, I told you my first time, like openly speaking about it uh -huh. in a dialogue back and forth. It's uh, not with one, one or two of my very close friends or, or therapists, if you would. And so this, it, it, this, this is difficult because to, uh, man, to admit you may have a problem and I'll say may for just cause I want people to ease into this. Like mm -hmm. it's okay to question that you look at the culture and that, that I came out of, uh, yeah, have heavy with the drinking. Right. And it's looked at as almost acceptable, even though we know it's not in the military, like you get in trouble and you got to go yep. to programs and you can be put on hold and you can lose your job and clearance. And it's just like, uh, now mix COVID with that people have been inside. So if you look at like the, the liquor store that's down the road that I, that I did go to, it's like the number one seller. I had like the number one profits in the state. And I, I, I was just it. like, okay. I was just like, wow, that store, you know, is the number one in the whole state, not because of Phil, but because of like, you know, I contributed to that, unfortunately, but like there's so many people in this area that are just medicating, you know, civilian and military alike that are just staying inside. 
for me, it was one drink and then two drinks. And then all of a sudden now I'm doing mimosas, you know, and because it's like, Hey, we're at home, we're in quarantine, you know, let's have fun. And, uh, to, I realized that like, it's become like a, a bit, a bigger issue. Okay. So, and yeah, like I said, uh, appreciate, um, you help navigating me because this is difficult to talk about to say like, Hey, I was drinking too much. Right. But it's like, why was I drinking? Uh, I will go ahead and talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I've never had a problem. I still do not have a problem going out in a social setting, having a drink, being social and coming home. My problem was that what I, with what I had going on in my life, I was medicating at home. Right. And then com- that was before COVID hit COVID hit. And then it got even worse. Cause I was even, I was home even more. And, um, when I, when I travel for jobs, never drink, I was sober. So I was like, Hey, like I've got these extra stresses on, you know, when I'm traveling, but I'm not drinking, but I'm only doing it when I'm home. And then it got out of hand. Uh, obviously if you bring it up in the military, it's like, Oh my God, you have a drinking problem. Okay. Let's, now you're in a program. Now you're not deployable. Now, now you're in a program. It's like, it's like, it's like high and right. And you're like, yeah. And these are and the same people who take it high and right. They're same, or typically the same people that have watched you have a problem or like made fun of you or like gotten uh, jokes or laughs at, at you drinking out, out of the bar. And it's, it's funny until all of a sudden like you raise your hand. Yeah. And so I, I told a friend, I said, Hey, like, I think I'm drinking too much. Like I'm, I'm having problems. Like I'm missing things. Like uh, I use it to control anxiety. Mm-hmm. And uh, which I was like, Hey, it's the only way I know how to calm down. Cause if I went to mental health, you know, we call them embedded, embedded mental health. And I was like, Hey, like I've got anxiety problems. Like I'm, I'm worked up. Like I can't think straight, you know, it's just different, different times. We've got different triggers from things that are going on. Like not in my wildest dreams. I never thought somebody would just put their hand on the shoulder and say, Hey, it's okay. You're not alone. Um, there's ways we can mitigate, you know, anxiety through, you know, yoga. And now I, I did the whole ice bath thing, but also, you know, through the, through medicine, and I'll never forget, like, they're like, hey, this is anti-anxiety medicine. You're going to be on hold for a little bit, but you're going to be able to do your job again. You're not going to lose your job. I remember the first time I was just like, uh, that I, t- I took the medicine. I sat there and I went, I, I kind of just cried, to be honest. Yeah. And I said, I said, this is, what it, this is what it feels like, not being worked up and having racing thoughts and my, my, my chest pounding and getting tight. You know, I can think, I feel, I feel okay. I did that without alcohol. So that, that definitely helped. But I had a couple individuals who were familiar and I was like, Hey, like, do I go to AA? And then I was like, no, that's too much of extreme. I don't want to be sober forever. I just want to like get some information. And I was, I was curious when I get my feet wet, if you would. And they were like, Hey, um, there's this program called the alcohol experiment. And, uh, the, the creator of this is uh, Annie Grace. Actually, she just kicked off, uh, sober. What do you want to call it? Sober, uh, March today. It's the first. Mm-hmm. And it's the program that I did and I did it for 30 days. I was like, you know what? I want to do a 30 day challenge. Let's see what it is. And I picked to go cold Turkey on alcohol. And, uh, it was, it was wild because I had a little bit of withdrawals, um, after a little bit. And then I had all the, cra- the cravings and then I had all the issues that you would have with coming off, you know, drinking, but the book, uh, that she, and the program that she has explained the science behind it. So because I was able to understand almost the, the, the playbook of what was going on, like, uh, in my head and in my body, I was able to rationalize like, Hey, this stuff's normal. You'll get through it. And this is how you'll get through it being sober. And I did 30 days and I was like, okay, I did 30 days. What next? I kind of didn't want to drink anymore. I felt better. Like I could think better. Uh, I felt better. I'd saved a ton of money. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, like, um, I'm on my phone right now, but so I can't pull the app up, but I've got an app called, uh, I am sober and it tracked how many days, how much money I did. An esti- uh, I estimated about like how much I was spending a, a week and then divided that by seven, obviously. And then, uh, so I just tracked how much money I've saved, but I was like, okay, so what is my, uh, being sober for 30 days allowed me to see like one, if I had a problem, how would I feel being sober? And then it would allow me to be in control, which was my biggest thing. I was not in control of my life with almost anything. It allowed to put, it allowed me to be in the driver's seat of saying like, okay, what decisions do I want to make going forward? It was very empowering, in an extremely healthy way. And I said, okay, so my problem is not social. My problem is at home emotional to try mm-hmm. to medicate. So I was like, okay, 
have I always? And then you started to dive into some of the workbooks uh, or the, not problems, but some of the, uh, the worksheets almost. And like, okay, like, have you always had this problem? No, like this developed because of this reason. And I was able to start identifying why I was drinking so much. And then from, from there, I, I got to redefine. I said, okay, so when I get emotional, I still have, you know, or, you know, from my past, you know, things that upset me, I, I turned alcohol to calm down. I was like, okay, I've done all this work between yoga, meditation, uh, being sober, the ice baths, you know, I've, I've, I've come too far to turn back to the bottle. I was like, I have all these other tools to use. So it, it, like I said, it put me in the driver's seat of determining like, well, how long did I want to be sober? And by realizing where the problem lied, I was like, okay, this is more of a subconscious problem. And, and it's a, it's a reaction to when uh, I get upset. So let's see how long it takes uh, to, for that to almost like work itself out. A couple months went by and I was like, okay, it's, it's still there. And uh, going further along, I was like, okay, I just need more time. Right. Like I need to be in another environment almost because I realized when I leave Virginia, like I'm okay. And I was like, all right, let's give, uh, let's give this some more time, some more time. And I'm almost into six months now. And I can't believe it. I was just like, wow where did the time go? I, I feel great. I've been in the driver's seat and a lot of people want to ask like, Hey, are you ever going to drink again? No, I, I don't know. I, I miss going out and having uh -huh. that social one drink, um, type, type experience. So if, if I do, I'll probably never drink in the house again, like, or wherever I'm living. Cause that's where you identified as the problem. Yes, because uh, the problem that I've realized is control. I was like, I'm in control. Well, you, I kind of am, but I'm still letting this thing control my life. Right. So because I'm like, I'm having to make these decisions because I don't have control over this thing. That's all. And that's a huge like rabbit hole we can get into with control over that. But I was like, all right, I'm going to start putting parameters and time frames on this. I'm going to do six months. Okay. I'm doing the trail. That puts me like nine, 10 months. I'm going to do a year. Right. I'm going to do one year sober for, I was just like, for one, like when have I ever done something for a year? Like consistently, I can't, think of something like that. And I was like, I'll, I'll do this. This will be, I'll get a huge win out of it and a sense of accomplishment. But what I'm learning about myself and where the problem actually lies, like I'm able to dissect it and almost like uh, get rid of the problem. Right. If you would. It, it sounds like and I, I'm totally um, kind of simplifying this for my own brain yeah. to kind of wrap, wrap around. It's a technical way of looking at it. That's the way at least it feels to me because yes. you're, you're analyzing it point by point kind of. Yeah. And you're bringing your technical background because EOD is a technical, you lived in a technical world, um, much like I do. I live in a technical world. And sometimes it's easier to see things like that rather than try to look at it from a totally psychological, emotional, because that could be more, yes. that could be scary. That, yeah, I, I don't want to think about my feelings all the time. I'm worried about no. my feelings. You know, I don't want to think about that. But if I can, mm. like you said, if I can go through these steps and if I can say, all right, was it always like this? All right, step one, yes or no. Uh, what were the trouble points? Okay, step two, one, you know, here we go. That's the way I'm kind of almost thinking about it in my head. Yes, no, absolutely. Having, having a good mix of it. Because like if you're if going through the emotional side the entire time, it's exhausting. Right, right. right. And um. You start to realize that uh, it's not about it's there's, there's like science is an amazing tool when you're trying to combat any type of addiction, mm -hmm. whether it's you're addicted to somebody from a, like a relationship or alcohol or drugs or or whatever it is. Like I, I realize that it's not really a it's not really I'll, I'll just be frank it's not really a willpower thing. That willpower is going to beat you down and you're going to be exhausted and then you're going to be like wow maybe if you turn back to the bottle you just feel defeated and you're even worse off than when you started that it's, you got to like pick it apart. You got to do a little emotional, a little psycho uh, psychological, you know, you know, definitely uh, analyze it along the whole way. Like I journal this, but like you got to realize like the problem is with the subconscious. Mm -hmm. Like I can sit here and say like, Hey, I think I have a problem. I'm going to stop. Well, that's cool. But you're, you're, a, you're fighting a losing battle because your subconscious has been programmed to, well, no, uh, you shouldn't stop because alcohol causes me to not be stressed out. It helps ease my day and it tastes mm -hmm. good. And then 
well, you start like analyzing and doing the technical aspects, you know, the, the science and psychology behind what's going on with that, you realize that it's kind of hard to start arguing it. It's like, Hey, the, the subconscious, how, how do I reprogram that? You know, and one of the first things in the first couple of pages of the book, you know, from the alcohol experiment is kind of how to do that and apply that to anything in your life. So it's really a reprogramming of your subconscious. Cause it, if it doesn't matter to say, Hey, I don't want to drink. Well, if I wake up, you know, anxiety attack, you know, at two, three in the morning, I'm going to be like, okay, what can calm me down right now? What have I been using? Mm -hmm. And your mind's going to jump to what it thinks works best. Yeah. And, uh, it's, you need yeah, the toolkit okay, so to get, you need the toolkit you need the tool to get kit. away from that. And that's, that's what I needed. And it, if you look at extremes, I don't really believe, uh, I, for so long I lived in extremes on one side or another of almost any subject or thing in my life. And that's where like, I started having a lot of problems. And that's why I realized that AA, I'm like, okay, AA, I can go and military won't know. And I can start taking control of my own life. But that's kind of extreme just to hop in day one say, hi, I'm Phil. I'm never drinking again. You know, and that, that's scary because people don't know if they want to drink or not. Sometimes they just want to question. If you can get somebody used to question, be like, hey, am I drinking too much? Well, you just answered your question there. I'll tell right. you right now. Uh, it's usually my go-to, but. Yeah, it can be definitely overwhelming and scary. It's why a lot of people just, they do what they know. They do what they, they think works, even though if it's destroying them. And yeah. to, to break out is extremely hard. I had to, I had to look at it. And like I said, uh, EOD attracts a lot of problem solvers. Like, how do you solve the, the problem? How do you put all the pieces of the puzzle together? And yeah. what I realized is I didn't have all the pieces to even start putting together. I had, I had too many blanks. And uh, are missing pieces. And for us, that, that can drive somebody crazy. They're just like, wait, wait a minute. This is what I do. I put puzzles together. What do you mean I don't have all the pieces? And the pieces, I mean tools. Right, right. So It's interesting. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, um, I, I, I'm trying to just loop it back around a little bit to yeah. you. So as you do this hike and yes. you are going to have all these stresses on you, I think this is a great experiment for you because yes, you're going to put... It would be very easy to stop at a liquor store along the way of this hike. I mean, for people that don't know what the Appalachian Trail is, it, it's most of the East Coast. And it used yeah. to be out in the woods like the whole time. It's really not anymore. Now you're going through. There nope. are sections that you're going through towns. You're, you're not out in the middle of nowhere all the time. You are sometimes. But sometimes you're just walking down a highway. Um, it would be very easy to stop at a liquor store when you get stressed out or your anxiety gets. So this is going to be a great test, not only of that, like you were talking about with your transition and getting out of the military and getting yourself right and figuring out things, but this year that you've taken off from drinking, this is going to be an awesome test for that. And, and an awesome Absolutely. test for this toolbox that you have built up now with how to deal with these stressors. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see how, how that all plays. And I'm glad that you're going to be sharing along the way with Instagram and YouTube and things like that. Yep. It's, it's Absolutely. Really good. Thank you. This is the first time I've like openly talked about it. So it's like, yeah. Hey, how much do I want to say, even though I probably have said this before it's, this is extremely uncomfortable to talk about mm -hmm. and you want to try to get it out there. You just don't know how to, how to, how to talk about it. Like you're like, Hey, I have a problem. It doesn't matter what your problem is. It doesn't have to be drinking. Like just talking about it is extremely uncomfortable, but the more you do it, uh, the more comfortable you get, but the more you do it with people that are like, like a, a safe thing, if you would, a secure container for you to do it to, that don't sit there and judge or make fun of you. Like the more easier it is to open up. And I, I just want to say like, th thank you. Like this is, oh. I know I've answered questions online. I posted like some of the science about it, but to say like, Hey, I was drinking too much. Like it was causing me like actual issues. And then, uh, uh, so thank you. Uh, as far as the trail, absolutely. It, it's gonna, it stinks because I realize I've been able to like hone in, you know, like target, like where I have the problem with drinking and it's not on the trail drinking a beer, like around a campfire. No, but the, the fact is that like, I can go do that. I'm fine. Like there's no, like, well, I need to have 10 more or anything like that. It's just, but it doesn't matter because there is still an issue. There is an emotional trigger. And that's what I, I've got like, because of, you know, my connection with the emotional triggers and drinking, like it's just a no go. Right. Like for me. So it's, you know, I know there's gonna be people that are probably around a campfire. Like, you know, 
having a drink and relaxing and understand like you, you look at any long race like they, obviously some of them give out beers at the end of it you know yes, they're they like do. I've, I've done long bike rides you know 100 mile race if you would and what happened at the end of it you know I, you know I was chugging yep. down you know yeah you get a beer at the end right or yeah, two like, is sponsoring it and here's your beer <laughs> And actually, uh, you know, a lot of people are you uh, agree, disagree, but it helps, right? What happens yeah. when I have a really long day and someone's like, hey, here's a beer to help out. And I'm like, no, okay, I'll, I'll take the mustard packets and pickle juice instead today. Thank you very much, yeah. you know? <laughs> right. But it's it's uh, trying to be sober while transitioning. Uh, one of the difficulties we talk about, like loss, is it's like something we did. We gathered around mm-hmm. the drinking well and we, we talked, right? I'm not saying we all, everybody got drunk. Like people had like a casual couple of beers, you know, talked about the day, talked about the, 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 the drills, the mission, you know, whatever it was. And it's just something, something we did like a round table and just, there's no, there's no alcohol for, for me right now. Yeah. So it's like another, you're like, man, it's another sense of loss. So. Yeah. But, but I think, it is a loss, but it's it's addition by loss. You're you're getting to a place that you're going to be a much happier person down the road having yes. done this year and having done this during the transition. Yeah. Was it the easiest time to pick during transition? Probably not. Mm-mm. Uh, you Mm-mm. know, there's probably a lot of easier times that you could have done this, but I think you'll get more out of it because you're picking the hard time. Uh, Agreed. you're gonna get the benefit from it. Um Listen, uh, I, I spoke to you uh, uh, beforehand. I've always had this very back and forth relationship with alcohol. I was always the party guy. Um, I was always, yeah, we're going to go out and we're going to get drunk and you know, we're going to do this, that, and we're going to have the funny story that we're going to tell two years from now. Yeah. And that's great. And, that, and I, I wouldn't trade any of those stories. But I would- There's some, some of them are some pretty good stories. They're you know? great like, stories. Yeah. But you know what I would trade? was the stupid times when I did something yes. dumb or when I hurt somebody, um, you know, uh, and I'm not saying physically hurt somebody, but when maybe no, I let I somebody down or, um, you know, somebody was, uh, I said something stupid yes. because I wasn't thinking about everything that I should have been. You've saying. got somebody counting on you, but you're hung over or you've had, yes. you stayed out with, with whatever group you're with, you know, like for, for another, for one more and one more, it turns into like, you know, several more in hours and yeah. start letting people down. And that's what did it for me. Yeah. And that's, and, and that's yeah. why I think you're going to, you're going to get a lot out of the hike and just everything that you're doing, because I think doing it under these stressful conditions and with everything that's going on, it's going to make it that much kind of sweeter. And it's not going to matter at the end of the year, whether you have a drink or not. No. If you do, you do. If you don't, you don't, but it's not going to make a difference. I don't think. Because it's not going to be a defining no. moment. So one of the great, greatest things about being on the trail that, uh, that I put into my head, and like I'm huge on manifesting. Like uh, this is, and this is like my thought process. Why that? That's why that map is like the whole trail is right there in front of my bed. I look at it every single day. Like, day, like when I wake up and I go to bed. You know, analyze it a little bit. But importantly, like it lets me like visualize what's going to happen. Okay, I'm going to be on the trail, right? Mm-hmm. Last thing I want to do. I kind of, I would like to do this in a hundred days, under four months. I've got a buddy's wedding, you know, pretty brother's wedding in July to, uh, to get to, if he still has it, you know, I've got college programs going on. I want to spend time with my family. Like mm-hmm. I don't really want to spend the whole, like some people take seven months to do it. Well, listen, I don't want to do that. So what is it going to take? Unless somebody just has a random bottle on the trail, which I'm going to stay away from. It's, and it's not like, Hey, there's a bottle. Let me grab a drink. Like, it's just think about what it's going to take for me doing this to go grab a drink. I have to, of course, I'm going to be stopping by convenience stores to re-up on yep. supplies, which are going to serve alcohol. I get it. But in general, that's far and few in between. Like yeah. I have to leave the trail. I have, I have to actively seek out alcohol. Right. And that's not something that really has been a problem. Like if it's not present, I'm, I'm not really going to go You're seek okay. it out anymore. It, it yeah. was a problem a, a while back. And that's when I realized, was, hey, like, man, I'm now seeking this out. Mm-hmm. And I'm not able to function unless I have, have it almost. So I moved past that, but like, I, I have a lot of like roadblocks. I'm on the trail at the end of the day. Like, do I really want to spend time waking up? I, I, I hate being hungover. It's like the biggest thing in the world. Like yes. there's nothing fun about it. Like there's no. no, like, you know, like there's, I don't really have like any good funny stories that'll last forever about being hungover. It's, just, it's a terrible no. time. And I like, I'm still in shape. The older you get, the worse it gets. Unfortunately. Yes, sir. Like, it does. <laughs> 
so what I'm going to spend time like breaking my one mental cycle of getting up and hiking because I'm hungover. What's going to happen? You're going to wake up hungover if you drink on the trail. And then this happens like this is the reports, you know, I've listened to quite a few videos lately and the rest of the group you're with that night before is probably going to wake up early and go. And you're going to wake up and feel defeated. Like you're yeah. just like, Oh, great. And you're going to like start to cycle. spiral. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not trying to hop back in that cycle. I'm trying to wake up rain or rain or shine and, and, and knock this thing out. But yeah, it is. I'm definitely curious to see where my mind goes with it. Mm-hmm. Cause right now I'm kind of, I'm kind of stuck in this, like almost like telling myself just to find like, Hey man, you figured out what your problem is. You should be able to go out and have a drink. Yeah. But yeah, that's true. I could go out right now, have a drink with a friend, come back. You're perfectly fine. But I do have like things that pop up and like, I've had thoughts where I wanted to, to turn to the drinking when I'm home. Like when I got upset about something and I was like, okay, like I'm still in it. So it's just a complete no go across the board. And after I do this year, maybe I'll start integrating the social and see what's going on when I'm in a new environment after I've had the whole year off. And the trail is definitely like dude, sober trail for me. Yeah. And um, I think, I think one of the, the biggest things is like, we look at like we kept bringing up like in a community like hey people drink it's almost yeah. accepted until until you raise your hand and say it officially but uh to to admit it, it you know it draws a lot of negative people are like oh man it's not that big of a deal or like i, I didn't i don't i won't answer how much i was drinking because people want to like justify their drink you know they want to put me mm-hmm. down and say well that's not a lot well i'll tell you like that was more than a normal person should drink Period. Like, there's no really arguing about the numbers. If you want to compare numbers, we can compare numbers. And in a day, like, it's more than anyone should drink. Right. So just because you're drinking more doesn't mean that, like, oh man, like you think you have a problem, or like, or like, how much were you drinking? They, some people just want to downplay it. Some people want to judge and see if they have, like, oh man, I'm having two drinks. He's having a hundred drinks. Uh, I don't have a problem. You know, like, so, dude. I had a problem with drinking. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much it was. I had a problem with drinking and I questioned it for a long time and I felt a lot of social pressure. And eventually I was just like, this is not serving me. Um, and try to wrap up a little bit too, that you said like a perfect time. There's never a perfect time to do this. Yeah. Like, yeah. so what uh, if you, I've identified or even started to question that you have a problem or an issue, whether it's drinking or anything in your life, it's not going to get better once you started to become aware to the problem. It's going to get worse. It's going to fester. Like maybe that'll cause you to start drinking more. If we're talking about just alcohol, whatever, mm-hmm. the, whatever it is, you're going to dive into whatever to start medicating more. Like there's never going to be a perfect time to do this. We always have shit and hard things coming up in our life. It's just like, Hey, what's going to be thrown at me next? We don't know. Right. It's not like, Hey, let me wait till I'm not so stressed out. I don't have a lot going on. We're always stressed out. We always, always have, a lot gonna have something going, going on. on. Yep. Just, just do it. Just day one, just do it. It's not like, it's like a lot of people with like, well, I'll start it on Monday. Well, I'll start this January 1st, you know, this new year. And that's like a, a defeated mindset. You know, now if you're taking a weekend, say like for me, I'm like, Hey, like on Monday, I'm going to start this. That's all right. Like, but that doesn't mean you're going to get plastered all weekend long. Right. Right. And you're right. Gonna, you're going to start to like, Maybe you're, gonna, maybe you're having 10 drinks. Okay, maybe I'm going to have like one or two, you know, and then on Monday I'm going to be, you know, whatever you decide. But like, as long as you're starting to mentally put a plan together and a game plan of how you're going to execute this on Monday, and it's not just like wishful thinking, that, that, that's all right, you know, yeah. but be like, hey, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to get all, I'm, I'm going to do it next week, you know, or I'm going to do it on Monday. Like, you're just putting off the inevitable yeah. and you're probably going to put it off forever, to be honest with that mindset. So for me, I was just like, as soon as I heard about, you know, the program, I was just like, I'm going to do this. I said, shit, I'm not ready. I said, I'm really not ready to start this, but. That's probably means uh, you should. I was like, you know, I sat there with myself and I was like, dude, this sucks. I was like, I, I like drinking. It helps. Mm-hmm. And that, that's the thing. And then like that exact statement, you know, I read the first couple of pages and uh, she walks you through this program. It's like, I, I enjoy drinking. Okay. You state why. I drink because it relaxes me, causes me not to be stressed out. Mm-hmm. And then you, uh, the, the second step is you kind of explore that is like the truth behind that. And that leads you to the third step um, to where you can, you, you, you do a 180. Drinking stresses me out because you just, you just flip your original statement 
And you start listing reasons why drinking stresses you out. Drink, drinking stresses me out. And actually, it's kind of overwhelming, though. And kind of like, uh, I almost rejected it at first. Drink, drinking stresses me out because, well, I'm hungover. I miss things. I let people down. I spend money. I spend too much money on it. You start listing all these reasons why. You start reprogramming how you think to it. And that's mm-hmm. how you can get the upper hand on sobriety. One, one of the many. It's, man, I'm like. It's hard to talk about, man. No, I, I Listen, I. I like hearing you talk about it. I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm listening Thank to you, you talk about it and it's honest. It's not something from a TV show. It's not somebody trying to sell me something. It's yeah, an I want honest... to be scripted. I thought about being scripted and having like my bullet points so I could stay on track. And it's just like, I don't know how to talk about this hundred percent. Right. And then just, how about that? Like here's somebody who's been sober. I had a, I had a decent problem, right. To where like my, I wasn't sure I couldn't, I couldn't function as a human being, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, mixed drinking with depression, right? Um, a, a, a terrible combination. I'm not even gonna make a joke about it or try to like yeah. anything. Like, you know, you're not showering, you're not eating, you're not, you know, your roommate's picking you up off the floor because you're, you drink too much, you know, you've been home for 30 minutes and or like an hour already, you know, like, and that's where I was. And I was like, I'm an adult, I'm a human being. And now another human being is trying to like, literally pick me on the floor and get me up onto the couch, you know, cause I'm upset and I'm a mess and trying to transition from that to work. Like, man, it was too much. Yeah. So like, what I guess what I'm trying to say also is that like, yeah, I, I don't know how to talk about this stuff hundred percent. I'm just, I'm doing it. And if anyone who's listening, you're like, man, like I'm scared. I'm worried. I don't know how to talk about this shit. Neither do I like, and right. I've been doing it for five and a half months. Like I'm still figuring it out. Maybe one day, you know, like you listen to like a uh, psychologist, like Jordan Peterson uh, speak. They've got, they've, they got their shit together as far as like how to speak upon it. But they've been doing this for so long. And I was listening, you know, uh, I was listening to, to him speak about alcohol because, you know, he says like, why would anyone, like one of his things from his book and his, uh, what do you call his episodes? He's like, why would anyone want to stop drinking? It's a hell of a drug. In order to stop drinking, you need to find something that's better than drinking. It's more powerful. And it's kind of hard to do, you know, especially if you don't have a relationship with yourself. Like, so that's why like the the trail is definitely like a sticking point for me. You know, it's it's a challenge. I'm sitting here like looking at my map right now and holy hell to go from Georgia to Maine on foot is a lot. But I I visualize, I visualize so many pictures of, of, of people um at that final summit and i was like man that's gonna be me yeah that, that's that's gonna be me and i'm gonna learn so much about myself and everyone's like it's life tra- it's life transitioning and uh that's what i need and mm-hmm. I, it's hopefully i can help people while i do it and i figure out how to do it i'm gonna struggle probably you know what videos to put or what to talk about and i'm really hoping the community helps guide me like it's gonna be a lot of like what you guys want to talk about because yeah, I'm, a, I'm now I'm just repeating myself. Like, this is not easy to talk about. I'm learning how to do it. Yeah. Because you look at something like it's so normalized. Oh, oh, you got a drinking problem? Or, oh, you drink a lot? Okay, that's all right. Oh, you got anxiety right. and depression? Oh, okay. Hey, I don't really want to talk about mm-hmm. that. Can we, can we go back to the thing that's destroying you and talk about alcohol? Because, like, we really like how fun and stupid you are and making, and, like, laughing and having memories. Like, yeah. people like that. But, There's an identity you know, to it. Yeah. There really is, you know, like I said, and then that's always been kind of me is, is that I'm the life of the party. Yeah. I've done some funny stuff. Yeah. Like, I do I, funny like, things. I tell funny jokes and stories. Okay. And that's yeah. great. There's nothing wrong with that. Unless it's beating down other parts of your life. And like you're saying, if you start having effects other than the fun and you said it with the, with, with the book. Okay. Now, what is the negative that alcohol is doing to you? Okay, that's the po- yeah, positive. Yeah. It's there. Great. Awesome. It's fun. It, like you said, it tastes good, you know? But what are the negatives? And what? And when it starts outweighing one or the other, then that's when you need to do something. You need to make a change. Yeah, especially with, uh, I agree, uh, the book, man, in the greatest way possible, it really messed up things for me as far as like drinking because mm-hmm. you, t- you talk about taste. Well, uh, we won't hop into, uh, uh, we won't you know, spend too, uh, time on this, but like it explains well, are you really tasting it? And it explains like the science behind what mm-hmm. you think you're actually tasting. And then like, the first paragraph is like, why do we feel the way when we drink? Why do we have one drink 
the different neurotransmitters and chemicals that are being released in the body. And then the, the other ones that are being released to, to counteract those. And basically your body after one drink is your brain's like fighting itself to, and you, that's sorry. I'm getting excited on this one because like by understanding the science, of what was going on, it, it ruined it, but also gave me the tools that I needed. Cause I was right. like, wait a minute, if I have a drink, this is happening in my head right now. And I feel like shit. And I feel like I need to have another drink because this is happening. Like I was able to like almost analyze and break it down. Right. Or, I mean, the book did that for me. So I was like, okay, why do you feel more depressed than when you first started drinking after a couple of drinks? Well, the science is pretty clear. It'll, it tells right you exactly there. why mm-hmm. it's right there. So like, how do I go to the bar and enjoy having a few drinks when I understand what's going on now? Yeah. So, well, as you yep. know, I, I talked to you about some of the stuff that I'm doing in the future here. I'm training yes. for a half marathon. Very exciting. Yeah, which I'm, I'm thrilled about. And like I said, with my heart stuff that happened in the past, to be able to say, if you would have told me back in August that I was going to run a half marathon in June, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, yep. And I am looking forward to that. It's kind of my trail. I am, I'm the training that I'm going to do ahead of it is really what I'm looking forward to spending that kind of time with myself out on the road and just running. Um, I do a lot of thinking while I run, I listen to my music. It's it's very relaxing to me. Um, but I'm also looking for more than just that. So I said this to you earlier and I'm going to say it now to the audience. I want to lend my support behind what you're doing. And I also want to take care of myself um, yeah. and do the right things for myself as well. So for the entire time that you are on the trail from um, not even for that, we're starting now, we'll say starting yeah. now to March 1st, March 1st to when you're done with the trail, I will also be giving up alcohol and I will also be putting it out to the audience. Anybody that wants to join us, throw your support behind Phil and throw your sport behind yourself and maybe just do something Absolutely. a little different for you. Um, please, uh, you know, I'll post a little bit about it. When I'm, how I'm doing with my training and stuff. I know either way it's going to be good for my training a hundred percent because again, nobody wants to run hungover. That sucks. Um, you no. will not run if you're hungover. Yeah, guaranteed. Like, it's not fun. Not fun. Not fun at all. And I just, <laughs> I, I told my wife about it. I said that I was going to do this uh, after I spoke to you and mm-hmm. I just want to do it for myself. It's something that I, I think is good for me, especially with my heart and everything. I don't need any extra alcohol in my life. Um, it's just good to be feel control and to do something healthy for myself. So I want to do that while you're out on that trail uh, as support for you, but also as kind of a, a guide for that. me. So uh, I will be doing that. And again, anybody out there that wants to join us doing this, please, you know, post with it. We could, I might even set up some type of a hashtag or something like that. So we could see how everybody's doing. I'd love to do that along. Yeah. And, and we it, can, it helps. It helps to have somebody doing it with you. Even if I like, it's very, it's, it's very powerful to have somebody start with you. Mm-hmm. Like, Hey, I'm going to be sober today. I'm going to be sober today after having like an issue with it or, or just not even an issue, just deciding to take a break. Like That's you right. don't even have to have a drinking problem. It's literally a break. And I'll tell you, like, uh, I will just, I'll say it's so empowering when you look back and you're like, man, how long have I been sober? And you're like 14 for two weeks. You just went from like, I can never do that. And this like defeated mindset of like, I could never do that. Oh, I'm doing it. It's very addicting because now you're like, what else can I do? Right. Right. And it just, but, uh, I had a friend, uh, I kept this, uh, kind of private. Um, but I had a friend who was like checking it. We, we did this together. And we were both five and a half months into this thing. You know, somebody you know talked about like I was drinking a lot more and uh, the way what my issue was was different. The other person was like, hey, I kind of want to take a break and I'll do this with you because I want to see mm-hmm. where I'm at. And they're like, I may never drink again. So awesome. doing this with somebody, do this by yourself is difficult. I highly recommend doing it with some kind of community mm-hmm. because like you're going to struggle and it gives you like a safe place to uh to be like hey like i'm struggling today well hey yeah you're 10 days in man you're struggling because you want cravings and your body wants that sugar go have a spray go have a shirley temple go have a candy bar like uh pr- you know people that, that's what i do um huge on the shirley temple and sprite thing mm-hmm. but like uh having that person with you that's not gonna be like oh come on it's just one drink or oh you're stupid or oh really somebody that's like doubting you, like stay away from those people, you know, like, and, just in uh, general, you'll, you'll, stay away from those people. You'll, you'll, you'll take somebody who's 
in that environment of people uh, of that type of mentality and those people who they call friends. And you're going to hop into this other community of people that support you. And you may have never had that before. A lot of people will reject it because they don't feel worthy or worthy of it. And they're like, well, why are these people being so nice to me? You know, well, those, are the and that's like another eye opener. I mean, it's a whole nother transition. I'll try to stay out of uh, too deep, but like you hop in this community of people who care about you. You may not be used to that. You may just, you may just be used to being treated like crap or having mm-hmm. friends that put you down or, you know, or they're questioning your drinking because they have a drinking problem, but they're not ready to admit it. So you're like, Oh, I feel obligated. I'm just going to peer pressure, social pressure. I'm going to stay in this group and keep drinking because I don't want to lose my group. Even though I know I should take a break. Like, dude, I think this is an amazing idea. Um, I'd love to try to, uh, we'll figure out a hashtag. Yeah. We'll figure something out. We can put it out to everybody. Because, like, and like, no, like I, I don't tolerate any type of uh, peer pressure. Like I always try to play the middle. I'm like, Hey, like, that's not, that's not okay. This person's trying to better their life, you know? Um, but people, it's just a, it's create this group of people. that just want to support each other. Yeah. You don't have to be from the military either. That's the biggest thing. You know, like uh, we talked about with the hike, the one point I did not get to make is that like was such a gap between over 300 million people in the country and 1 million active duty 15 ish, if you would veterans, like there's a huge gap. People don't understand. So like exactly what's going on. And like the trail let me spread awareness to yep. a lot of different communities, but also, you know, having people that maybe are not military uh, and this as well, they can understand some of the struggles. We can understand their struggles. They can understand our struggles and we're doing something together. Nah, that's awesome. So listen, I've kept you for almost yes. an hour and a half now. <laughs> um, and we've covered a lot of stuff. Listen, we we've, did. We've, we've covered transitioning, special operations. We've talked about some of the challenges that are out there, mental health, things to be doing. Anybody can find out more about you on that Instagram. You're very, very active on Instagram. I know that, but where can people find out all the stuff, YouTube page, all that kind of stuff? Where, where, where can they, especially as they go, as we go through the the trail? Yeah. So I will be posting a lot to YouTube coming out right now. I've been my own worst enemy with trying to figure out like how to plan this, overthinking it. Um, I'm working on a video in the next couple of days. I'll have one of the first, like, Hey, I'm Phil trail videos going mm-hmm. up. And then I'll definitely talk about like everything that we talked about on here and reference back to, to this episode. Uh, a lot of it, you know, I keep man, trying to transition, pack, move like a, a dozen different things. Like it, it's a lot. However, yeah, YouTube will be where you guys can follow a lot, uh, of my, of my journey and the adventure going forward. And I'm getting to the point where I'm just going to say, Hey man, I'm just gonna start putting stuff out may not be like, and I'll just get better as I go Yeah, w- with it. But I'll have a couple of, a couple of videos this week on YouTube. And um, like I said, it's going to be a lot of it community driven. Uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a good ride for the hype. Awesome. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. I, I really am. I think it's going to be great. Um, it's going to be fun to kind of pop in with you and, and see how you're doing and, you know, maybe we could kind of set something up along the trail where we could do a little interview about love, midway to. through to see like a little bit of an update and, and how you're doing. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely figure something out for that. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, I, I greatly appreciate this opportunity. And we, we, we did a lot of, uh, we did cover a lot of different things and that's mm-hmm. what I, I love doing. We can definitely hop into one of these specifically and you go into detail and in depth. But what, what I like doing is like giving a lot of different information out there and seeing what people like. Yeah. You know, because maybe people don't want to hear about sobriety right now or, or ever, but they want to hear about the hike or they want to hear about transitioning, you know, or maybe one thing that we said in like the half dozen things we talked about will we'll hook somebody. Definitely. And then, uh, yeah. Now, uh, so we could, we can expect that first video coming out in the near, near term. Um, and then when are you actually stepping off? As of now, I'm going to do, uh, uh, 21st of this month. Okay. So three, three, two, one, you know, I'm a, uh, I've got a lot going on right now. Uh, I may be heading up to Boston to, uh, for a, for a program for a week, which if that happens, I definitely want to talk about that with you. Oh yeah. And, um, so uh, they're trying to see if they can fit me in right now, trying to get a couple things finished with the VA, but, uh, I've got three weeks of the day. It seems like mm-hmm. I'm going to get all this together, step off on the, the 21st and that's Sunday. Awesome. Dude, it's going to be awesome. I, I, it's the only way I can describe it. I'm, I'm looking forward to it for you and for everybody that's going to kind of follow along with you. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. So um, it, uh, it's going to be something yeah, special. Yeah, I'm, ex- I'm excited. I'm excited. nervous. I think like 
uh, the whole trying to document and talk to people and like get a message out. It's like what I'm actually most nervous about. Like I can throw all this gear on and then get, and then, you know, hit the trail. Like, but trying to get the message out is what I'm struggling with. And yeah. uh, I hope I help other people that have stories and messages be able to get theirs rolling as well by seeing yeah. me like, Hey, this guy's got all our shit together. Well, I kind of, there's some things I don't know what I'm doing yet. Like, I don't know how to do this stuff, but I'm just gonna go figure it out. You right. Know? right. I'm just going to jump in and do it. Yeah. I think that's what I'm about to just start, start doing. Awesome. Hey, again, Phil, thank you so much for spending some time with us and, to, and, and telling your story. And I know that it's not easy to talk about, but you did a great job Yeah. with an honest look at, you know, sobriety, an honest look at mental health and transitioning out of the military. So I do appreciate it. Right. Thank you very much. This was, this was a lot of fun. All right, Matt. I you look have forward a great to doing day. this again. Yes, you we'll too, be okay? doing it soon. All right. Take care. Take it easy.